Situated along the Southern Oregon coast, rural Coos County voted 59% in favor of Donald J. Trump in 2020. Several local zealous supporters were so incensed that Joe Biden won, they traveled back twice to DC strategy sessions before finally storming the US Capitol on January 6, 2021. Motivated by disgraced General Michael Flynn, one insurrectionist, Rod Taylor, narrowly won a seat on the nonpartisan Coos County Commission. Since taking office, Taylor has misused his platform to try and impose conspiracy theories to the electorate. To this end, he invited known election denier provocateur Douglas Frank to a commission meeting. Frank likens his talks to starting little fires and then throwing gasoline on them. Frank's many false claims included hacking the county's 2022 election in real time, despite the air gap preventing such penetrations. Enraged local citizens responded by showing up en masse at the following meeting to inform Taylor that Frank is a thoroughly debunked charlatan. People cited peer-reviewed studies exposing Frank's analysis as being based upon profound statistical errors and numerous articles characterizing Frank as a fraud. Taylor responded by calling us all math deniers. Taylor invited Frank back for an extended work session. Working with Coos County Commissioner John Sweet, Stanford University Professor Justin Grimmer, a recognized expert who has testified in many high-profile court cases, agreed to debate Frank. What follows is my post-debate interview with Dr. Grimmer. I'm here with Justin Grimmer, a professor at Stanford University, and uh, I'm going to let him tell him a little bit about himself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so as you mentioned, my name is Justin Grimmer. I'm the uh, Morris M. Doyle Centennial Professor of Public Policy in the Department of Political Science at Stanford University. I'm also a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I co-direct uh, a lab called the Democracy and Polarization Lab. I um, do research on a lot of things, study a lot of, of different areas of political science, but lately I've spent, certainly over the last couple decades, spent a lot of time studying election administration, how our elections are run. And certainly since the 2020 election, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand why people think American elections are broken and evaluating those claims, see if there's any veracity to them, and then uh, trying to explain or at least convince folks in instances where we know that the elections aren't broken, that they should have trust in those elections. Well, I appreciate that because I think democracy is uh, pretty much dependent on having trust in our elections. Um, you and I became acquainted when uh, a Coos County Commissioner by the name of Rod Taylor invited um, Douglas Frank, uh, a self-professed election integrity expert, um, to speak before uh, the county commission. I gave him 15 minutes, snuck him in as a late, late agenda item, and um, and he, you know, went on and on about uh, basically. Uh, we'll uh, get a little further in that, but he he's he goes around the country uh, telling stories, claiming that he's figured out some algorithm that he's just the exact right person to have figured it out. And um, and that and then he essentially insults the county IT guy, the county clerk, <laughs> everybody else in there. So uh, we had a lot of people came to a subsequent meeting of the commission and argued um, that he was not qualified, that he's been debunked, that he's. He's been uh, discounted in courts and uh, in peer-reviewed papers, of which you are a co-author of some of them, and um, and that it was an embarrassment to the county to have brought this person to to an actual county commission meeting. Um, nonetheless, uh, our commissioner um, is was undaunted, and he started. He he set up a an extended work session uh, on October 10th, where he was just gonna have Doug Frank there uh, doing what Doug Frank does. And um, and so I reached out pleading and um, and you were gracious enough to come up and, 
and work with uh, one of our other county commissioners, John Sweet. And so we were able to present a counterpoint to um, his, uh, his claims. The one thing about Frank is that he's uh, very glib. Um, he, he's uh, loose with the facts, liberal with the facts. Should I say that about a hardcore conservative? And, um, and I'm not sure that anybody's mind was changed by the little battle that we, that we had between you and he. Um, I think if they came in as, a, as an aficionado of uh, Doug Frank, they left feeling the same way. And uh, for those of us who already doubted Doug Frank, we, we were even more confident in our decision. Um, but uh, what I thought we should talk about today, you helped me point out some um, lies. Um, is, it, is it okay to use that strong word? Yeah, uh, I, I usually would say misrepresentations. I don't wanna impute motive here. He maybe just doesn't understand some of the statistics or doesn't understand uh, what he's doing. So. Uh, may not be a lie. It may just be that he doesn't understand some mathematics. Okay. So um, I'm going to change over um, to a different screen. Share screen. Um, there we go. Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to uh, explain what's going on here? Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know, part of what's interesting about what Doug Frank has to say, I mean, there's a lot of elements to it. That's super interesting. He's a, a fascinating person. Um, so he makes this claim that there is some broad and deeply entrenched conspiracy that's manipulating elections everywhere. According to him, manipulating elections in my county, Santa Clara, manipulating elections in Coos County, manipulating elections in Lake County, Indiana, where I grew up, it's everywhere. And he's remarkably un imprecise about how this is happening. Uh, you know, so he hasn't identified, or not at least not publicly identified, anyone who he thinks is involved in this process. And you know, he hasn't caught anyone who's an indicator who has you know confessed to being involved in this. But the thing that he points to as clear evidence for this fraud that's being perpetrated is that he can, he claims, unnaturally predict election results. And so um, this is a claim that my research group has evaluated. Um, and we've explained and explained to him in as many ways as I, I can possibly think to do it over the last three years that he's just factually incorrect when he says that he can make these sorts of predictions. So what do I mean by these predictions? So the claim he is making is that he can predict the turnout rate for all 19, 20, 21 year olds, every age in the state of Oregon with a single number. And he calls that single number the turnout key for the state of Oregon. And during my presentation, I showed, well, this simply cannot be the case. Simply can't be the case because there is a lot of variation in the turnout rates. If I tell you I can perfectly predict the rate at which 25 year olds turn out to vote in the state of Oregon with a single number, it must be the case that in every county in the state of Oregon, all 25 year olds turn out at that same rate. So that's not true. So I put that up and he, he stands up at the meeting, as you saw, and he said, look, you're, you've set up a straw man. You're evaluating a thing that I don't do. He also then added this just totally odd line where he said, Plus, you're doing something absolute. I'm making a relative prediction. This is a mistake people make. That's the thing he said. So I want to talk about that latter point first. Um, and while I don't you know, think we should characterize his sort of misunderstanding of this as a lie, what he just said there is to use a technical term, total bullshit. Uh, and that's as strong as language as I'm willing to use here. There's no sense in, sense in which what Doug Frank is doing is a relative prediction or in any sense that I did something different with that absolute. And the reason that I'm so confident in calling that bullshit is because 
the absolute he was referring to referred to the way in which I evaluated whether his prediction was exactly correct or not. I used a metric called the mean absolute percentage error. And the absolute there is really a reference to using this function we call the absolute value. You may recall this from a math class you took. So if I take the absolute value of negative three, it's three. You know, I'm using a negative error and positive error, it's going to contribute the same thing. So uh, he's there, he's, I think, just trying to kick up dust. So this first point about the straw man is another interesting point. Um, I, you know, in the moment, didn't expect him to say that I had done something different, but it occurred to me almost immediately after the meeting that uh, I know that I'm doing the exact same thing because I have Doug Frank's Excel spreadsheet for the state of Oregon from litigation on which we were on either side. He was going to be an expert witness for the Sipple defense in Washington County versus Sipple. I was uh, retained by the state of Oregon. Um, uh, in, as a part of those proceedings, and I ended up testifying about why Doug Frank shouldn't be an expert, and he was excluded. And so, you know, very, I realized this, and I, I sent you, Mary, just a quick guide to uh, at least how I know that I had done the same thing. Right. And so, what you're seeing in front of you is just my tour of this Doug Frank spreadsheet. Um, and all this shows is that Doug Frank does exactly the calculation that I said that he did. And so he has this fundamental error where he confuses correlation in the count with correlation in the turnout rate. And the reason he thinks he's doing so well is because he's looking at the correlation in this count, which is, um, which is sort of cheating. Um, it's interesting how resistant he is to this. I, in the exchange in the meeting, I think I explained this probably four times. And it was mostly for his benefit. And finally, you know, at no point did he really seem to comprehend what I was saying. At the end of that exchange, he said, well, I know that I did it because I'm the one who did it. Okay. And he sort of just like was asserting <laughs> that he had reached this prediction. Um, so, uh, you know, all I'm going through here, and, and I, I assume Mary, I'm certainly happy to, to share this document with whomever might want to see it is just taking some screenshots from Doug Frank's spreadsheet, which I'm also at liberty to share with whomever who, who want to see it. And what you can see is that the key thing that he's making a prediction about is turnout rate. He takes the turnout rate for an age group in a county and multiplies it by the number of people he thinks are in that group in the county. And then he correlates that with the actual turnout rate times the number of registrants from that age group. And so really the only thing he's predicting is the rate. That's the only place in which you could do better or worse. There's no sense in which the count um is is an accurate reflection of what's going on with his with his um uh predictive mechanism and so then the rest of here i'm just basically showing like look i can go into a spreadsheet i can do the exact same thing with his own data that i said i could do in my talk and i get the exact same number so there's there's nothing surprising here um the only thing that's surprising is I think the extent to which Doug Frank was really willing to blatantly misrepresent himself. And what he's counting on, and this is what's interesting, is in the room, there's probably three people who are equipped to evaluate the statistics. It was myself, and then I had two of my graduate students were with me. You know, they've taken advanced econometrics and statistics. You know, they know right away that when he says it's relative, like, well, that's bullshit. Um, but, you know, if you, don't sort of live and breathe statistics. And this person gets up there with this wildly inflated resume and, and you know, basically misrepresenting who they are. It sounds like this could be a, you know, an actual dispute between two people who are sort of mathy people. Well, I, I agree with you. I think um, looking back on that meeting, one of the things that I thought was that you were too polite. <laughs> <laughs> but um but I can I totally understand you know how that how that came about um and I do believe I mean you're fascinated by the numbers I'm fascinated by the gullibility of so many well gullibility I'm certainly interested in the gullibility of Commissioner Rod Taylor but uh, can I can I, I just like inter interject there really quick because I I don't think I would use the word gullible I um you know in in Rod Taylor's defense this is someone who's representing themselves to be a world expert yeah. and allegedly telling a hard truth 
um, is, you know, should Rod Taylor, it's a matter of, you know, who you want to trust, but, you know, Rod Taylor is not in a position to evaluate the statistics. If someone's claiming that they're a Nobel Prize nominee, for goodness sakes, and they can uh, perform these calculations, it's, you know, I think the ultimate blame goes back to, to Doug Frank, who should know better. And then, you know, there's some failure in discourse that we can't uh, more clearly convince people that Doug Frank is, is full of baloney. Well, I, I agree with you to a point. Um, at the same time, I think because he's using county resources to bring this person here to further his personal, um, his being Rod Taylor's personal um, uh, conspiracy that uh, Donald Trump actually won in 2020. And um, I think he, it's incumbent upon him to, to really like do some research. So I don't, I, I know that you reached out to him and the uh, other two commissioners. I, I'm, I never asked you, but I'm speculating that you never heard anything from Rod, that he probably wasn't interested in anything that you had to say because he's already made up his mind. And um, and I, I to me the fascinating part is that people will believe believe Frank because they want to believe him, and and not because they're really interested in the truth. You know, I haven't uh, you know followed up with Rod directly. I will say that during the meeting, he was very polite to me yeah. and and deeply focused on what I had to say, asked appropriate follow up questions. So. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm sure I didn't change his mind just, you know, from the things that you've said. Yeah, you definitely but, didn't. Yeah. Uh, but he, um, I think he did everything he could to give, give the opportunity for me to, to say what I, what I had to say in a sort of fair and public way where he didn't, you know, uh, express a bias towards me, I would say at all in the meeting. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. He, he did. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I think it was like uh, five days later, he, um, he came out with a litany of 13 reasons why he's convinced that, uh, um, that Trump, Trump won in 2020. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and he did talk about Dr. Frank. He never once mentioned your name. <laughs> During that, during okay. that entire that entire thing, um, so so, do you feel like you've covered this, or is there anything else that you want to go um, down? I mean, I, I would I would just you know sort of reiterate again this this is not theoretical, it's not speculative. Um, it definitely is the case, at least with the calculation, that I, I know that Douglas Frank's assertions about prediction are just wrong. And it's just a matter of time until he sort of, I think Doug Frank gets it or he'll never get it, but, you know, we're able to demonstrably prove it. Um, the second point here, I think, uh, is a sort of interesting one. It was a throwaway line by, by Frank, but it is related to some of the points that uh, Commissioner Taylor brought up in his discussion about why he thinks Joe Biden's win was illegitimate. Um, you know, there's just so much of talk where people think these election night with the quote unquote spikes were evidence of fraud or that there's something odd about the election night reporting of votes. And what's fascinating, I mean, the number, again, a number of things fascinating about this. So first, the report of votes that we see on the news, that's not the official vote reports. That comes from a, a company. Usually that company's Edison. Sometimes it'll be from the AP. And they're out there doing the best they can to figure out the number of ballots coming in from different precincts. And sometimes they're hooked up to the official results, but not always. And so, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theorizing about how votes get added and subtracted. Well, that's just Edison mis -implement, uh, incorrectly implementing the results. The second thing is, you know, there's all this discussion about late at night in Wisconsin that votes got added all of a sudden. And then usually people say, like, while you were in bed. Well, I think a number of us weren't in bed at that time. Like every election night, I stay up all night to see what's going on. <laughs> and um, everyone who followed that election closely knew there was a whole bunch of Joe Biden votes that were going to come in. And that was going to be because, for example, in Wisconsin, Milwaukee is going to report a lot of votes. 
By the way, you see those same spikes in every state where there is a big concentration of Democratic support in an urban area. So you saw them in Ohio as well, the Trump won Ohio. It's also the case that you sometimes see the reverse. So for example, in Arizona, if you recall, Joe Biden started with a big lead and then that sort of bled away and eventually finished with a really, really small lead. Um, okay, so you wanna keep going on this list here? Sure. Cause I have a, a bunch sure. of stuff to say. Okay, so Frank cited this case in San Joaquin County about a commissioner um, who had been involved in some voter fraud. So that's 100% confirmed. That commissioner is gonna be um, sentenced in mid-November. We're supposed to be sentenced back in April, it got delayed. So this, this though, I, I don't understand why Frank thinks this is evidence for his conspiracy theorizing, because it's very clear this commissioner was acting alone and uh, is a kind of this like rogue actor, persistent criminal kind of person. So he had been caught up in a, like a lot of other fraud. Um, at no point in this is there any evidence for the broader conspiracy that Frank is referencing. Um, okay, so then just a few other points here from the list. Frank mentioned this 200,000 ballots from New York to Pennsylvania. And this is fascinating. That has been uh, thoroughly debunked. The person who made the claim is this guy, Jesse Morgan. He's like a ghost hunter. He's also, you know, less entertainingly been arrested for domestic abuse. He is not a reliable guy. Um, he gives a deposition where he's like, look, I'm not very good at estimating numbers. I kind of think maybe there were ballots in my, my uh, truck. This organization called the Amistad Institute gets a hold of that information, has this big press conference where they're like, we think this truck can hold this many gay lords, which is what you call the thing the envelopes are in, and that's 200,000. And that must explain these like late night ballots. So you've seen uh, Doug Frank mention it, John Eastman has mentioned it many times, You know, uh, President Trump has as well. Um, it's, it, it's total baloney. It's been debunked completely by the United States Postal Service. But the best evidence against it is just reading the truck driver's own deposition where he's like super shaky on what the evidence is. Okay, I have just a couple more things uh, about that, that Doug Frank said that was a little bit wrong, unless you wanna, you wanna dive in. No, go ahead. No, no. okay. Okay, so the, there's this other very interesting incident in uh, um, the, uh, during our presentation where I point to this paper by two of my former grad students, Approval Lal, who's now uh, in the causal inference group at Netflix and Dan Thompson, who's now a professor at UCLA. Okay, so they wrote this really fascinating paper. These two, these guys are experts in statistics, mm -hmm. um, which is how, you know, Purva makes a lot of money working for Netflix now. Um, and so they studied the effect of the Center for Tech and Civic Life, Grant, Life Grants, which are the organization that Zuckerberg sent up for the set up for the 2020 election, and whether it had any effect on vote share or turnout. And what's fascinating there is that despite all of this rhetoric, despite all of the claims, and Douglas Frank making the claim that CTCL is at the center of his conspiracy, despite all of those claims, their paper shows the causal effect of the CTCL grant on Democratic vote share is zero. The causal effect on turnout is zero. Okay, so I brought this up. Frank points to CTCL. I'm like, well, you gotta read Law and Thompson. And he's like, I have, I have read Law and Thompson and they make a common mistake. The mistake they make is that they assume that you would only stuff the ballots of Democrats and Republicans. But of course you would stuff, you know, some Republican ballots because it's gonna redirect people. So what was going on there is that Doug Frank had not read the paper at all. Okay, so he assumed that what they had done was they had looked at voter file turnout and the party registration of those who had turned out. <laughs> in actuality, um, uh, in actuality, um, they looked at the actual vote share, either in counties or in precincts where there are CTCL and the actual turnout. So for Doug Frank's critique to be correct, you'd have to believe CTCL was going out and doing all this fraud and intentionally making it look like there was no effect at all, which is of course absurd. And, and he, obviously he doesn't mean that to be the case. Like if he had read the paper, he wouldn't say that. But this is a very common thing that you see when you're a professor. And maybe we've all had this moment when we've been in a class. You know, you have someone who hasn't done the class reading and then they have to do a discussion and they kind of make something up and they want it to sound like vaguely plausible. And that's what Doug Frank was doing. But again, in that instance, he was he was just full of full of it. Just there's nothing yeah. there.
So yeah. two, th two things about that. One, um, as you, as you know, uh, two of the commissioners, uh, Rod Taylor and Bob Main voted down a, you know, with no strings attached grant from CTCL for our county clerk. Um, and one of the things that Rod brought up as proof that uh, Biden cheated uh, was that Zucker, Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerbucks, got um, involved in, in the elections and predominantly favored Democrats over Republicans. So, um, um, as you pointed out, or this study pointed out, I, I have not read that study. I've read all the stuff you've said that you've written, but I haven't read that one. Okay. Um, but but um, it seems uh, it, there's just no basis for for that for that claim or belief. Yes, and it, in fact, okay. So there, there's a few ways to think about it. So we can say, what's the effect of this money? Did it cause a certain party to get more votes? We know the answer there is no. Did it cause more people to turn out? The answer there is no. By the way, I don't think the people at CTCL were very excited to find out that their grants didn't cause anybody to turn out to vote. I think they were trying to get people to turn out to vote. They didn't care for which party, but yeah. So that you know, that's a pretty impressive finding, I think. Um, but beyond that, the typical location that received a grant was a place that voted against Hillary Clinton, and that is just completely missing from all of this. The CTCL process was such that people were just applying and they would get money. Now it varied a lot across some states just said, let's get the money for everybody, you know, and they had like a centralized application. By the way, those are like Republican states. Other places had a bit more diverged, but because there are many more Republican counties in the United States than Democratic counties, because Republican Republicans tend to live in a large number of sparsely populated counties where Democrats tend to live in a small number of heavily populated counties the typical county receiving money from CTCL was a Republican county. So it, it doesn't even make sense, like as a theory of it, there's a you know a report that comes out from a, retire, a retired Supreme Court justice in Wisconsin, Michael Gableman, that misunderstands a lot of stuff, how elections are run and sort of makes these unfounded accusations against CTCL. And this sort of, you know, conspiracy type machine picks up those allegations and runs with it. Um, so there's no no basis for that. So the last thing I would say is that uh, there's like a separate and interesting normative issue. People may be skeptical of private money coming in to change the way elections are being administered. And I want to I, I you know I want to fully endorse the idea that people can be skeptical of that or prefer to only have public funds involved. Um, I think that's a fine position for some it does it's different than my position, but uh, I think that's like a reasonable position for someone to have. They should not have that position because they think the CTCL grants had a big effect in 2020 because just the basic fact of it is that they did not. But separately, you know, you can be skeptical of of private money coming in for a variety of reasons. So before we go on to number six, and it's a little slightly uh, off topic, but one of the, one of the things that, um, came out was, you know, is he going to write a response to your peer-reviewed study, which I don't have queued up here, but um, evaluate, evaluating um, claims of election fraud, um, paraphrasing. And, um, and he, he did indirectly sort of in, in response to a certain trial, um, you said, and you were telling me about it, and you and you did send it to me. Again, I don't have it queued up, but um, it uh, and you had made this comment that he uses this bathtub analogy, and I honestly thought, oh, you're just being flippant or something. And no. and then I read it, and there and he he does, and then he talks about assigning this tub full of um, ping pong balls. Is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, and with a digit. But he doesn't. He doesn't even specify which digit, like zero through nine, or I don't know. But anyhow, yeah. any, anyhow, I was stunned when I read that. I mean, I, not even being a statistician, I, I. So, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit for me? 
Yeah, so uh, there was a chance that Doug Frank was going to be called as uh, uh, someone for John Eastman and John Eastman's disbarment proceeding. And I worked for the uh, state bar. I was retained by the state bar in that case. So I testified a couple times at that proceeding. Uh, and my role there is just to evaluate the claims that are being made by one expert that John Eastman had admitted. And then this sort of cavalcade of people who are making the claim the 2020 election was subject to manipulation. So Doug Frank produces this paper and the, the paper has a number of claims made in it. So interestingly, uh, the dispute there was a disagreement Doug Frank and I have had about Placer County elections. So Doug Frank made the claim that in Placer County, every, every precinct has the same rate of Republican turnout. That's his claim. Mm -hmm. And every precinct has the same rate of Democratic turnout. And every precinct has the same rate of independent turnout. Uh, that isn't true. <laughs> you know, you can just very quickly see it, but it has the same feel. So he makes this claim that there's the same turnout rate, but then he doesn't actually evaluate the rate. He does this thing where he takes his prediction about the rate, multiplies it by the number of people in the, the precinct, and you end up with, with things that look really tight along the line. So um, I had contacted Placer County officials when I heard Doug Frank make this claim, which was at a Lindell symposium. And interestingly, the person who directs uh, Placer County elections, this great guy, Ryan Ronco, and he was, he was at church. <laughs> he said his phone's blown up because everybody's like saying, you are being called out at this Lindell symposium, which is being broadcast everywhere. It's a poor guy. So they um, invited me in, to attend the meeting that Doug Frank had with them. I saw the meeting with them where, you know, they politely listened to what Doug Frank had to say and then, then pushed back on his claims pretty clearly. So they push back on the claims. Uh, in this report, what's interesting is Doug Frank just blatantly lies about what was said in that meeting, says that he basically had convinced the Placer County officials and that they were concerned. None of that had happened. Doug Frank then you know, blatantly misunderstands either directly or indirectly, because he's not very good at math, um, uh, misunderstands the representation I make. And then this last section is just odd in a way that I, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it in any sort of public discourse. So at dispute here is whether I've shown there's a mathematical reason why Doug Frank thinks he's doing so well. And, and so I've shown this a number of ways. There's a number of ways you could reply to this. You could try to say that I've some way, you know, screwed up my mathematics. I've made some incorrect derivation, something like that. That would be the appropriate response. So instead what he does is he says, look, I'm actually going to show you that Justin's wrong. And I'm going to do it by supposing that we're drawing ping pong balls from a bathtub. And it, it, immediately you're like, kind of like, what? I, there, like, just to be a little bit more fair to him, there is like in probability classes this long tradition of saying we're taking like marbles from an urn or something. Never a bathtub though. Yeah. Uh, so he assumes the conclusion in his bathtub metaphor, which is like very clear. He's like, I sample one number, it's a seven. And then I know everything else will be a seven. That's surprising. Clearly some sortings happened. Uh, what's interesting about that is like, you clearly don't know anything because I have no idea how the bathtub ping pong balls got there. Maybe it's like only a ping pong ball, like a bathtub full of sevens. It doesn't make any sense. And he's like, but now suppose we go out in the hallway and I have another fishbowl full of bath. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. It's, it's nonsensical. Um, yeah, it's hilarious. I have a 16 year old daughter who's very into debate and I you know, showed it to her because it's a sort of fun debate thing. And she was like, oh, he's assuming the conclusion. This is absurd. And then, then you know, she, she like looks at it, she's like, you can't do that. <laughs> you know, um, it, it, uh, it, 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 you can do it. It's just not a good idea. Which, uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's the oddest thing in the world. And he did a similar thing he used a different metaphor during the meeting. That's a similar thing. He's like, you know, what Dr. Grimmer doesn't get is that um, we're like looking at pictures of grandma and, you know, really then if you're looking at pictures of grandma, it doesn't matter how much you inflate it. What we care about is like the ratio between the eyes. And that's amazing for a number of reasons, but mostly because my point is that we should be looking at that ratio, which is like what he said yeah. in his metaphor. So he doesn't understand it. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm just sort of convinced. What am I convinced about? Like, what do I take all this about Doug Frank? You know, Doug Frank is someone who 
did have some publications in the in, in 1990, right around then in major journals. It turns out there was a big error in that publication. He's never able then to secure a full-time faculty job. So he goes from being, you know, what he thinks is like sort of superstar chemist to someone who never really gets a full-time faculty job. And he sort of then, you know, disappears, uh, becomes a math teacher, which is a you know great and honorable calling. It's not what Nobel Prize nominees in chemistry do. Um, not what world-renowned scientists do almost always. They, you know, go work in, in the academy or they go run big labs for corporations. So he's a high school math teacher for a while. And then he's had this, you know, opportunity sort of later in life to have this um, little bit of fame. And I think that little bit of fame and the, the sort of uh, praise that he gets and attention that he gets traveling around, I think he, he really likes it. I don't think he's very serious about getting numbers correct or analyzing things in, in, in a way that's, you know, truthful. I think he's just much more interested in getting to the next town and giving a spiel. Yeah, I think there's two things to that. One, uh, in a, a quote I read in one of the articles, maybe it was the LA Times, he said, you don't win with data, you win with a movement. And, um, which is his way of saying the data doesn't matter, it's just getting people behind you. And I feel like um, the, the other side of it is, is he doesn't ever do these presentations in front of the academe, other than you, maybe. I mean, I'm not aware of him. He, he goes to these little tiny communities with, with people who are not likely to have um, taken a lot of math and and even the educated unless they focused on math are not going to necessarily um, pick up on on these um, anomalies and um, but he doesn't he, he doesn't like you know I don't I don't know why he isn't uh, presenting at Stanford for example <laughs> or, or, yeah, or wherever yeah I mean if um... I mean, there's, there's a great point there, right? So uh, I'm somebody who's published a lot of heterodox findings, you know, that drives my colleagues crazy. So I have, you know, very different, a very big difference of opinion with my colleagues about how voter ID works. I talked about a little bit of that at the meeting. I think I've convinced the literature about that. That was an uphill battle. I got, you know, tarred and feathered for my opinions about it early in my career. Uh, but you keep persisting. People listen. You know, if data's on your side, it's going to work out for you. He could do that. He could. He's welcome to submit to any one of these journals. If he thinks he's got it figured out, he should write a paper. Um, he, it would. I think it would be helpful for him because he's extremely unlikely to ever be admitted as an expert in court because he has no demonstrated expertise and you know no training in this area. Um, doesn't doesn't really know a lot about statistics, and I don't want to go too far into it. But he's he puts out these like videos about how to do various things. And it all, it, it's a little, like, some of it's a little silly. Like, he, he doesn't really know how to estimate things. He's, he's like, super confused. Um, and so, uh, you know, he should, he should definitely try to write an article. I think he'd learn a lot. He should read some of the academic literature on evaluation of elections on this area called causal inference. I think that would all be very helpful to him. Uh, I think contrary to what he may believe, the level of statistics in, in the social sciences far exceeds uh, his, you know, sort of recollection of 1990 chemistry statistics. Um, number six. The, the last thing is he made this claim about 180,000 more ballots, uh, you know, received than applied for. There was 180,000 absentee ballots received in Milwaukee. So okay. um, that, I mean, it's just wrong. It's a weird, wrong claim. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I've I've over, overstepped here. Um, I appreciate you just speaking with me today and I'm gonna package this up um, and make a couple little videos and when I'm done, I'll send them to you. As for, it sounds great, yeah, thanks for having me on. This is fun. I will thank you uh, okay. for everything, believe me. So, and enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, that should be good. I'll talk to you later. Okay, thank you, bye. Uh, be in touch, bye. I will.